Professor Hanyang Sun holds, holds the key touch professorship of electron device physics at the Cambridge Lab Laboratory and awarded a Royal, Royal Society Research Professorship in 2020. He has an undergraduate and a PhD degree in physics from ETH Zurich from, 19, from 1995 to 1996. He worked as a postdoctoral research fellow at Princeton University. He has been working in Cambridge on the charge transport physics of organic semiconductors and other functional materials since 1997. He is a co-founder of Plastic Logic and Flex Enable, a technology startup company commercializing printed organic transistor technology. He worked on the charge transport, photo, and the device physics of conjugated polymer and molecular semiconductors, as well as hybrid organic and inorganic semiconductors. Today, Professor Henning Srinhaus will give us a talk about the transient lo localization physics in organic semiconductors. Let's welcome Professor Henning Haus, please. I will stop my sharing. Well, it's my great pleasure to um, be with you this evening, um, both because, of course, um, I've been to Tianjin a number of times and I've had a long-standing collaboration with Wen Ping, um, and it's been it's great to have an opportunity to um, discuss science again on this occasion. And it's also a great pleasure um, for this to be part of um, um, a smart mat um, lecture series. A smart one has been a fantastically successful journal, and I've I've really enjoyed being um, um, a part of that. Um, so the topic of my lecture today is um, transit localization physics in organic semiconductors, and um, what I want to talk to you is about how we understand the charge transport physics of of these materials. And of course, you know that there is um, that these are of interest for a wide range of um, applications. OLEDs, of course, the most important one. Organic photovoltaics have astonished everyone that they've come um, with increasingly um, good performance with power conversion efficiencies now reaching 18, 19 um, percent. Um, there's a lot of excitement about the application of organic semiconductors in bioelectronics, implantable or skin-based electronics, where you make use of the um, unique mechanical properties of these materials, and also in, in, in electronics. And what, some, what most of these applications have in common that um, they rely, of course, um, on the optoelectronic properties of these materials, um, but they're also very uh, dependent on the charge transport properties, because in all of these applications, you need to get pass a current through the material and you want to do that as efficiently as possible. And so on my research, I've been focused on um, understanding the charge transport physics of, of these organic semiconductors. Um, and um, as you probably know, that, that effort has been um, largely using field effect transistors as a means to study the charge transport and also evaluate the carrier mobility of these organic semiconductors. And one of the central goals of the research has been to, of course, improve carrier mobilities. And that's been quite a successful endeavor. Um, the carrier mobilities of organic semiconductors over the last 20 years or so, they have improved from initially very low values to now quite respectable mobilities where we have organic semiconductors that have carrier mobilities on the order of one, 10, some of them, some of materials even higher um, uh, mobilities. And there are essentially two classes of organic semiconductors that are of interest. Um, there are what we call small molecule semiconductors. Um, so structures like you can see them here. Um, I should maybe try to get my pointer to work just a moment. Um, um, can you see the pointer now? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Okay, good. So there are these molecular semiconductors. We can see some examples here. They form highly crystalline um, structures. 
And so that's a kind of a model system, of course, for understanding charge transport, um, because we don't have to worry too much about the disorder in the crystalline structures. And then, of course, there are polymers, um, and the polymers um, now have kind of similar mobilities than the small molecules. We have conjugated polymers that also um, have mobilities in the range between one and five centimeters squared per volt second. But in those polymers, of course, the structural disorder is, is a much more important um, uh, metric, and we need to understand how um, the structural disorder impacts um, the charge transport. And then um, in the third part of the talk, I want to um, talk a little bit about our work on doped con conjugated polymers, so where we um, uh, not use field effect structures, but where we bulk dope um, these materials to fairly high concentrations, uh, up to 10 to the 20 to 10 to the 21 per cubic centimeter. And of course, in that regime, um, there are other factors that govern charge transport, in particular, at those high charge densities, we need to also worry about the impact of Coulombic interactions between the carriers and between the carriers and the dopants. So um, these are the three um, systems that I want to discuss. So let me start by um, talking as an introduction, if you want, about um, molecular crystals. And so what you can see here on the right is the crystal structure of one of those molecular semiconductors that's been widely studied. Um, it's a molecule called pentacene, and it stacks in this characteristic herringbone stacking where you're basically looking down alongside the long axis of the molecule, and you can see this characteristic face-to-edge packing um, of the molecules. And the electronic structure of these molecular crystals is, of course, determined by the molecular orbitals derived from the pi electrons of those um, um, molecular units, and so we have a highest occupied molecular orbital, um, which acts like the as the valence band of the organic semiconductor. And then at higher energy, we have a lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, which is like the conduction band. And if you are an inorganic semiconductor physicist, um, you might think of the electronic structure of such a periodic um, lattice of molecules. Um, you could, like, like you do it in inorganic semiconductors, you can calculate the band structure. Um, so you, the dispersion of energetic uh, states as a function of the momentum vector in the Brion zone of the crystal. And if you calculate the band structure of pentacene, you get something like this. Um, and if you're familiar with inorganic semiconductor band structures, what's immediately striking is that the bands tend to be very flat. So the, the band dispersion as you go across the Brion zone is almost um, um, zero, but not quite zero. Um, maybe um, a few hundred milli electron volts band dispersion as you go across the Brion zone. And the reason for that is, of course, that the interactions, electronic interactions between molecules are not as strong as they would be in a covalently bonded inorganic um, uh, semiconductor. And that's because the molecules are far apart. So you can see here a plot of the transfer integral, which is a measure of these electronic interactions between neighboring molecules um, as a function of spacing between the molecules. And if you have a, um, a typical pi-pi interaction on the order of three to four angstroms, you can see here that the transfer integrals are not several electron volts as they would be in silicon, but they're only a, a few hundred milli electron volts. And that's the reason why these bands tend to be um, relatively flat. But if you look at the physical transport properties of a um, molecular semiconductor, here you see another prototypical example of uh, rubrine, which is a very widely studied molecular crystal. And you measure, for example, the temperature dependence of the mobility. You see that as you um, uh, cool down from room temperature to lower temperatures, you see the mobility increases. That's also something that you would observe in silicon. Um, and that's characteristic of um, um, a band-like semiconductor where electrons at, at higher temperatures scatter increasingly strongly with phonons, and that process, the scattering process, reduces the mobility. You can also see signatures like an, a Hall effect um, that um, measures the um, uh, transverse voltage that's developed in a magnetic field, and that is um, very similar to what you would see in silicon. And it says that the electrons 
in the um, or in an organic semiconductor, uh, organic semiconductor couple similarly to magnetic fields than they would do in in silicon. But then there are some in interesting differences, uh, things that you wouldn't observe in silicon. One of them is that the mobility um, of carriers in an organic semiconductor is very strongly strain dependent. So if you just apply a fairly small um, uh, mechanical strain to the lattice of a few tens of percent, you can change the mobility by tens of percent. And that's a very large strain effect, which you can't explain easily um, um, with the, within an inorganic semiconductor physics model. Um, and also in the optical properties, you see some quite interesting um, optical signatures associated with the charges in these molecular semiconductors. You see subband gap transitions that do suggest that um, the carriers are not um, kind of extended electrons like you would find in silicon. So it, the, it's been for a long time, it's been not so well understood how you can kind of understand these different signatures of transport within a consistent theoretical framework for the transport. And in the last few years, what's been realized is that the key feature of understanding these um, um, transport signatures is the structural dynamics of these molecular crystals. And what you see here is a, an electron diffraction pattern of um, uh, one of those molecules derived from pentacene, tips pentacene, this molecule is called. And you can see in the electron diffraction pattern, these sharp diffraction spots, but then you also see these diffuse streaks. And these diffuse streaks are a manifestation of fairly strong thermal lattice fluctuations. So where the molecules vibrate at room temperature, because the interaction between molecules is not covalent in these um, uh, organic semiconductors, but it's a weak van der Waals interaction. So the, that allows the molecules to vibrate um, against each other quite strongly at room temperature. And uh, we can use these diffraction patterns to actually calculate how large these thermal fluctuations of the lattice are. And they tend to be on the order of a few tenths of an angstrom at room temperature, which you can see here is the root mean square fluctuation of the, the lattice positions. Um, as a function of temperature at room temperature in this molecule, we have about a tenth of an angstrom of fluctuation. And if you ask yourself, how does that affect the electronic structure and the charge transport? What you need to look at is how the, uh, the transfer integrals, these electronic interactions that I mentioned before, they actually depend on the quite sensitively on the relative position between molecules. And you can see here a calculation of the transfer integral in, um, in, a, in, in a molecule, a tetracine molecule, as you slide two tetracine molecules alongside their long molecular axis, you can see how sensitively the transfer integral varies with position. And so um, there are positions where the transfer integral is maximum. There are positions where the transfer integral is nearly zero. Um, and so if you now imagine you're sitting at a particular point um, at the equilibrium lattice configuration, let's say over here, um, and then your molecule fluctuate, the, the, the lattice positions fluctuate as a function of time, that leads, of course, to fluctuations in the transfer integral. And the steeper this curve is, the larger these fluctuations are likely to be. So the way you need to think about electrons um, in a molecular crystal, they are basically sitting in a lattice that's not static, but where the neighboring molecules are vibrating all the time, and that leads to temporal fluctuations of the electronic couplings, temporal fluctuations of these transfer integrals. And so if you think about it at a particular point in time, an electron um, sees a dynamically disordered um, lattice, and as a result, the electron would tend to localize within that um, disordered landscape, would find a particular location where it, its wave function would be localized. But this localization is not permanent, but transient. And that's why we call this um, physics regime transient localization, um, because the molecular lattice evolves. The mole molecular lattice changes um, when the, um, uh, with the lattice vibrations. And if a few picoseconds or so later, the electron sees a different molecular environment, and then it localizes in a different location in, in the lattice. And so the way we think about charge transport and, and charge diffusion in such a system 
is is like a it's like a surfing motion of the electron on the waves of molecular lattice distortion. So the electrons are moving through the lattice driven by these waves of um, molecular lattice fluctuations. And that theory um, um, was developed by theoreticians, um, Simone Frattini and, and Alessandro Troisi, and it's been tested since um, L experimentally on a number of molecular semiconductors. Um, a particularly beautiful simulation that was published um, just a, uh, two years ago um, is this one here from um, Jochen Bloomberger's group at UCL in London. And what you can see here is the, um, uh, uh, in the bottom left plot, you can see a crystal lattice of rubrine. And at a particular point in time, you can see here a charge um, with its wave function localized. I mean, these colored um, uh, plots here indicate the amplitude of the electron wave function at this particular point in time. So the electron is localized in this orange region here. And then as you follow the evolution of that wave function um, um, in, as a function of time, 30, 30 femtoseconds later or so, the molecular lattice has evolved. It's, it, the, the vibrations have changed the molecular lattice. And as a result, at 192 femtoseconds, the electron is able to delocalize over a quite large region in space here. And um, so the, 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 the delocalization length of the electron um, is much larger at this point in time. And then a little bit later, another 40 femtoseconds or so later, you can see the electron over here localized again, but not localized in the same region of space, but has it's moved over by quite a large distance. And these, um, these long range hops that are essentially um, visualized here, they are the ones that govern the um, uh, carrier mobility. That's the process that essentially drives the charge diffusion in these molecular crystals. And so if you're trying to think about the mobility, how to understand the mobility in such a molecular crystal, it's typically governed by, or not typically, it's, it's essentially governed by two uh, key quantities. One is the so-called localization length, which is essentially, it's, it's a measure of how delocalized this electron wave function is typically. Um, and um, and, and it, the, essentially, you should think of this as a diffusive process where every time the charge hops, it moves by a length scale that's governed by this localization length L. And the time step in that diffusion process is given by the typical vibrational um, time scale. This uh, parameter tau here is a measure of how um, um, fast the vibrations happen. So it's quite a simple expression, and it allows us to calculate the mobilities of these molecular crystals. You can see that here is a comparison between experimental um, observed mobilities and theoretically predicted mobilities within this transit localization model. And you can see that the, pr the predictions match the experimental observations reasonably well. And what are the key parameters that govern these quantities, in particular the, what governs L tau? It's, of course, the transfer integrals in the different crystalline directions, JA, JB, JC, I've labeled them here. And it's not so much actually the magnitude of these transfer integrals that matters, but it's the relative magnitude. And what you, what you the theoretical, theoretical predictions, they show that what you would want for an, um, a kind of high mobility semiconductor is an as isotropic as possible distribution of these transfer integrals where JA, JB, JC are um, as equal as possible. The other parameter that matters is the thermal fluctuation of these values. So delta JA over JA would be the relative fluc thermal fluctuation of the transfer integral in the A direction. Um, and you want that to be as small as possible. So you want the mobility um, to be as little affected as possible by these thermal fluctuations. And then the third parameter is the um, it's the phonon frequencies. Um, you want ideally to be the phonon frequencies to be fast. You don't want any slow modes, um, and, but you want this evolution of the lattice to happen on a fast time scale. 
And so in principle, these uh, knowledge of these uh, different parameters allows you to predict um, mo the mobility of molecular crystals. In practice, it's actually quite more a bit more complicated because of course the structural dynamics of these molecular crystals is complicated because the unit cell um, is large. There's, in some molecules, there are 100 atoms in the unit cell. That means there are hundreds of phonon modes. And each of these phonon modes um, can, of course, be important. And so you really need to analyze mode by mode what impact these modes have on the thermal disorder. And a few years ago, we, we went through that exercise for a number of uh, molecular crystals. And here you can see a plot of the um, thermal disorder, this, this disorder of the transfer integrals measured in milli electron volts. And on the x-axis is essentially the contribution um, of to this thermal disorder from different modes, different modes of different frequency. And you can see here that not all the modes, there are hundreds of modes here, but not all the modes actually contribute very much to the thermal disorder, but it's only a few modes that make strong contributions. And in some molecules, a molecule here on the right, the C8 DNTT molecule here, you can see that it's essentially one mode um, that makes the largest contribution to the thermal disorder, and most of the other modes are, are less important. Um, so you really need to understand this um, thermal disorder mode by mode if you want to understand the charge transport physics of these molecules. I should say in passing, passing that we've, we've not only been interested in the charge transport physics of these molecular systems, but also in re more recently in the, in the thermal conductivity, the heat transport. And also there, these, um, the structural dynamics is very important. Um, you can see here a comparison of the thermal conductivity measured of these two molecules, uh, DNTT and C8 DNTT. And what's quite striking is that just the substitution of the molecule with an alkyl side chain at the end of the molecule here um, suppresses the thermal conductivity very effectively. And in the C8 DNTT, we've been able to see very low thermal conductivities going down to 0.05 watts per meter Kelvin um, and, and that's as low as it goes. There's not many materials that have lower thermal conductivities than this. And the reason for that is the structural dynamics again. So we've done a similar analysis um, for, for kind of phonons, how localized phonons are. And uh, what's come out of this theoretical analysis is that the reason for this ultra low thermal conductivity in the alkyl substituted molecule is in fact a strong localization of the phonon modes. You can see that here, it's plotting the participation ratio, or, um, which is a measure of how the larger the participation ratio is, the more delocalized the phonons are. And you can see here that for the C8 DNTT molecule, the phonons, all the phonons pretty much across the full frequency spectrum are tend to be much more localized than in the DNTT. And so that's the reason for this very low thermal conductivity that we are able to achieve in the, in the substituted molecule. Um, and I want to leave the um, molecular system. So this was an essentially more an introduction, general introduction of a model system. And now I want to talk about more complicated systems. Um, and um, I want to start with the conjugated polymers. Um, of course, I mentioned already that in conjugated polymers, we don't have these beautiful single crystalline uh, model systems, but we tend to have at best semi-crystalline systems. And so this is a cartoon that illustrates the microstructure of one of these um, semi-crystalline polymers where you have domains in which the polymer chains stack closely together, these orange regions here, but then you have other regions where the chains are more disordered. Um, and, and so, of course, that means that the energetics, the, the kind of site uh, energies, um, they will vary strongly depending on where you are in this morphology. And so charges moving through such a lattice of um, disordered, uh, so disordered lattice of polymer chains, they will encounter energetic disorder that will hinder their um, uh, charge transport properties. And you can see that very easily in the measurements of the mobility as a function of temperature. In these polymer systems, we never or almost never see a, what we call a band-like temperature dependence, like I've shown you for rubrine, where the mobility increases with decreasing temperatures. 
in these polymers, we always see a mobility that drops as we lower down uh, the temperature. And that's a manifestation of this energetic disorder that it becomes harder to overcome these energetic fluctuations um, at lower temperatures. So you might ask how similar or how different might the transport physics be? Um, from a theoretical perspective, um, it's clear that the dynamics, the structural dynamics of the lattice should also be important in a polymer system. And the easiest way to think about that is that if 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 you had a completely static um, lattice of polymer chains where the chains were just not moving, where they were just uh, completely static, um, but disordered, what the electrons would do is they would find certain sites in that um, disordered landscape where the electron wave functions would localize, where you would form eigenstates um, that are localized in particular regions. And then they would basically sit there, they wouldn't move. Um, and so essentially the carrier mobility would be zero in a system like this, so at low temperatures at least. Um, but what the um, effect of the dynamics is, um, is that they essentially the dynamics induces some coupling between these eigenstates. Um, and so, for example, if an electron sits in one particular region of the chain and it sees, let's say, torsional fluctuations of the conjugated backbone, that will induce a certain coupling between that eigenstate in, a, in this region of the chain, and it causes the electron to move along the polymer backbone. So these vi vibrations of the molecules, they also must be very important in a conjugated polymer system. Um, and so... Of course, the aim um, in the, of, uh, the, the the aim of the game in the last few years has been to find polymer systems that are um, as little have as little as possible energetic disorder as as possible, and so this is an example here of a system that we discovered um, or we investigated um, a few years ago. Um, we call it IDTBT. Um, it's a polymer that is actually not very crystalline. It's um, it's X-ray diffraction pattern, which you can see on the top, uh, shows fairly broad diffraction peaks, um, quite um, unimpressive. Um, um, but it turns out that the energetic disorder in this system is very low, and you measure this typically with the so-called Urbach energy, which is a measure of the steepness of the absorption edge near the onset of absorption. And the Urbach energy in IDTBT can be can be very low. In fact, uh, only some 25 or so, 23 milli electron volts. And the, the reason for that is that essentially the backbone conformation in IDTBT is very well defined. You can see that here. It's a simulation, a molecular dynamic simulation, um, where you can see that although the polymer chain is not straight and, and um, uh, very well um, ordered, but the conformation of the chain um, is very planar. So you can see here, it's a, it's a top view, and you can almost see no torsion along the polymer backbone. The, the, the variations in torsion angle is very small. And that's the reason why in this system we can achieve um, such a low disorder. And that's kind of uh, um, um, uh, rewarded with a high mobility. In IDTBT, you can achieve mobilities on the order between one and three centimeters squared per volt second. So it's one of the highest performing conjugated polymers um, um, still. We, since we've tried to, to achieve this low disorder in other ways, so this is like an example I wanted to give you um, of a polymer, a family of polymers that was developed by Ian McCullough's group, um, um, where basically it's an aldol condensation polymer where you have these electron deficient units along the polymer backbone derived from um, naphthalene and derived from anthracene. And then these units are coupled together and linked together, not by a single bond, but by a double bond. So the polymers are a little bit similar to the family of polymers that has been investigated by Jan Pace group um, at uh, Beta um, in the last few years. So in this case, we have no um, single bonds along the backbone, and we were hoping that um, that would now allow us to have a more well-defined um, um, polymer backbone conformation and achieve higher mobilities. And to some extent, that has worked. The mobilities are these are, these are anti-polymers. Um, the mobilities are quite high for an anti-polymer; they go almost uh, to one. Um, it's not yet a kind of record um, uh, mobility. 
But there is evidence um, in these polymer systems that this, this double bond linkage does in fact introduce a very rigid polymer chain conformation. And we've been investigating um, kind of the reasons that for that limit the mobilities in this system. So if you're interested, I don't have time to discuss that in detail, but have a look at this recent publication. What I want to discuss very briefly is um, how similar the transport physics of these conjugated polymers is to those of molecular crystals. And uh, in, as I said, in molecular crystals, we have this strong coupling between the structural dynamics and the charge dynamics. And we were looking for evidence that something similar also happens in the conjugated polymers. And so the most, the closest uh, evidence that we've seen is in um, electron spin resonance measurements of the spin lifetime. So in ESR, electron spin resonance, you can measure the um, spin relaxation times um, of electrons um, as a function of temperature. And so you can see that plotted here for this polymer system IDTBT, um, the spin lifetime as a function of temperature, you have two spin lifetimes, what we call T1 and T2. T1 is the spin lattice relaxation time and T2 is the spin spin relaxation time. Um, and I want to focus um, in this talk on the spin uh, on T2 because that's the one that's um, most sensitively uh, coupled to the charge dynamics. And so you can see here, three different regimes in the spin relaxation behavior um, as a function of temperature. At very low temperatures, you see quite long spin lifetimes at four Kelvin spin, as T2 is, uh, is larger than a microsecond. And then as you increase the temperature, the spin lifetime decreases uh, down to 50 Kelvin. And that's a regime where essentially the spin lifetime is governed by the precession of the spin of an electron around the local magnetic field. And the local magnetic field is determined by an external magnetic field that we apply in this measurement, plus a magnetic field that comes from the hyperfine coupling. So the nuclear magnetic moments associated with the protons, they, have a, they add a, a small component to the um, magnetic field. And this total magnetic field then points in somewhat random directions. And an electron that sits on a particular molecule, like you see here, starts to process, the spin starts to process around that local orientation of the magnetic field. And uh, But as the electron hops to the next side, um, that, that magnetic field direction is slightly um, tilted. And then the electron, as it, when it hops to the next side, it starts to process around the new direction of the magnetic field. And as a result, the, that leads to a spin dephasing um, because this uh, precession axis is no longer the same. And so that is the reason for this drop in the um, spin lifetime as you approach 50 Kelvin. As the motion gets faster, um, the spin, spin, process, spin relaxes more quickly. But then at some point, the motion, of course, becomes faster and faster. The mobility in these systems is thermally activated, so the uh, spins move faster and faster. And in this regime here, um, which we, we call the emotional narrowing regime, um, the essentially what the electrons start doing is that they start to average over the um, um, uh, uh, local field directions. They move faster than it takes them to process um, for one cycle, they're already on the next molecule before they have completed one cycle of precession. And then essentially the result of that is that spin relaxation becomes less efficient again and the spin lifetimes increase. But then around 150 Kelvin, something quite uh, surprising happens um, and which is that the, the lifetimes start to decrease again. And we were able to attribute this regime to a regime of where the spin relaxation is driven by the structural dynamics. Um, so at high temperatures, of course, the, the, the structural dynamics become stronger, the molecules vibrate more strongly at, as they approach room temperature. And because of the coupling between structural dynamics and electron dynamics, um, that leads to a mechanism for spin relaxation. You can see that illustrated here, um, that you can see the electron wave function here plotted um, along a chain of a conjugated polymer around this bend in the polymer chain. And you can see that at different times, um, the electron is at different locations along the chain. 
Um, and it essentially, the wave function oscillates back and forth along the chain. That's not a hopping process. It's not a hopping process that governs the mobility, but it's essentially a process that's driven by the structural dynamics, the torsional fluctuations of the backbone, the other uh, vibrations of the backbone, the carbon-carbon stretch vibrations, they basically drive back and forth the electron wave function along the polymer backbone. And every time the wave function oscillate, there is a finite chance that the spin is affected, that the spin relaxes. And so that's the regime which we see here at high temperatures um, in, these, in this conjugated polymer. And what I found quite striking, um, when you actually do similar measurements um, on a molecular crystal, you can see that compared in this view graph here, um, the molecular crystal is this one here, which is a measurement one done by Jun Takea's group in uh, Tokyo. And this is a beautiful molecular crystal system where the Mobility has a band-like temperature dependence. Um, mobility increases with decreasing temperature, while in our polymer system, the mobility decrease with, decreases with decreasing temperature. But if you compare the spin relaxation times, um, particular T2, this green plot here for the polymer, and the blue plot here for the molecular crystal, they look very, very similar. The T2 rises to a temperature of about 100 or 200, 150 Kelvin, and then near room temperature, it de the T2 decreases in both the polymer system and the molecular crystal. And we think that this is actually a probe of this coupling between the electron dynamics and the structural dynamics, that this, this rapid shuttling motion, this rapid surfing motion that you have in the molecular crystal driven by the structural dynamics, that happens also in the polymer systems on a picosecond timescale, and that process is visible or man manifests itself in the spin relaxation behavior and at near room temperature. And that makes it very similar in molecular crystals and in the polymer systems. So this is a quite a fascinating transport regime where the, there's a very strong coupling between the structural dynamics, the charge dynamics, as well as the spin dynamics. And that's quite a unique feature of these um, molecular systems. Okay, so now I, in the last part of the talk, I want to now focus on the most complicated system, um, which is uh, the conducting polymers, where we um, where we dope these um, polymer systems to a high charge density to achieve high conductivities. And so that's been done, of course, for a long time. It started, of course, with the pioneering discovery of Alan Higa's group in the late 70s in polyacetylene, if you dope polyacetylene with iodine vapor or with uh, um, arsenic fluoride, you can, you can achieve very high electrical conductivities. Um, and, and, and since that time, of course, there's been a, a great interest in these conducting polymers. Our interest, uh, current interest is mainly motivated by applications of these um, conducting polymers in thermoelectric applications. You probably know that it's very, um, uh, we use energy very inefficiently. Uh, if you look across the energy um, economy, about two thirds of the primary energy is actually not converted into useful energy services, but it's wasted as heat. A lot of that heat is, is at low temperatures below 300, 400 degrees C. And so if it would be really important to use energy more efficiently, and one way to do this is to somehow utilize that wasted heat and convert it back into more useful forms of electricity. And uh, one, one way to do that is to use thermoelectrics. Um, so a thermoelectric essentially um, build uh, generates a electrical voltage when it's gener when it's placed into a temperature gradient. And the fig figure of merit of a thermoelectric, you, as you probably know, is this um, uh, parameter ZT, which is a uh, product of the Seebeck coefficient, the, the voltage thermal voltage that's generated um, in a temperature gradient, and you square that um, and multiply it with the electrical conductivity. Um, and divided by the thermal conductivity. And so it's quite an interesting problem to find materials with high Seebeck coefficient, high electrical conductivity, but low thermal conductivity. I don't want to say too much about thermoelectrics here. I just want to use it as a motivation for why we are interested in these conducting polymers, um, because of course, one of the 
aims is to achieve materials with as high as possible electrical conductivities. And so that leads me to the um, question that I want to address in this final part of the talk, um, and that's to, to understand what factors govern charge transport in such a highly doped conducting polymer. Of course, we have to expect that the same physics, the same transport physics that applies in FET systems, um, of course, in FET systems, the charge densities are much lower. Um, typically in an FET system, you have charge density of 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 19 charges per square centimeter. So essentially the charges are isolated from each other. They move within that dynamically disordered um, uh, landscape. Um, but um, in, a, in a conducting polymer systems, you have that as well, of course, the, the charges see the same molecular environment. But on top of that, you have to worry as well about because these charge densities are so high, you need to worry about the interaction of electrons with each other, um, the Coulombic repulsion between electrons, as well as the Coulombic interaction between the electrons and the counter ions. Um, and uh, one of the questions that's been um, interesting us is to understand how important these um, Coulombic interactions with the counter ions are. Um, because in a, so this is an example here that's been studied um, some a few years ago, when you dope this molecule pentacene with um, F4TCNQ, F4TCNQ is a um, molecular dopant that has a um, deep um, LUMO level, uh, it's an electron accepting molecule, that, that where the LUMO level um, of the do uh, dopant is below the um, HOMO level of the host molecule, the pentacene HOMO level, and then an electron transfer happens from the pentacene HOMO onto the LUMO of the F4TCNQ, and as a result, you generate a hopefully mobile um, a a hole um, on the pentacene. So it's p-type doping of pentacene. And what's been shown um, in this in this work here is that actually these um, as a result, of course, the, the F4TCNQ molecule ends up negatively charged, and the hole on the pentacene is columbically bound to that um, um, negatively charged um, F4TCNQ molecule. And that induces these columbic traps in the energetic landscape where electrons or holes are actually quite strongly bound to the site of the dopant counter ion. And that means the energetic landscape becomes significantly more disordered as a result. Um, and of course, that's not good. I mean, if we are interested in achieving high uh, charge uh, conductivities, we need to worry about um, how can we reduce the impact of these columbic traps. And so we've been setting out um, how to understand how important these um, uh, columbic traps um, are. And for that, we, we, we needed a kind of better controlled dopant methodology, which allows us to um, vary in a systematic way the size and shape of the counter ions, because we were thinking that if we could vary the size of the counter ions, we could change the distance between the center of the counter ion and the um, conjugated um, molecule. And in that way, st study systematically how the strength of these Coulombic interactions impacts the charge transport. And so this molecular doping technique is not very suitable for this because with any host molecule, you have quite a limited number of molecular dopants that uh, dope efficiently. Um, and so we were initially thinking about electrochemical doping, where you have essentially an electrode providing a driving force for the incorporation of ions from an electrolyte into the conjugated polymer um, and, and, and dope, it, uh, dope the polymer system that way. And that, of course, is, is, works very well. It's been uh, done for, for a long time. But of course, it always requires an electrochemical doping setup, which is, is, is something that's not so easily applicable to a device um, a structure. And so we, um, we've used a, a method, an ion exchange doping method that was developed um, a few years ago by uh, Jun Takea's group, where essentially you have, in this case, we make the polymer film um, with a in the solid state. So we deposit the polymer film, um, anneal it, make it nicely crystalline. Um, and then we expose the, um, the film to a dopant solution that contains two species. One is a molecular dopant, 
um, that is, is able to induce an electron transfer from the organic semiconductor. And then the second species in, the, in this solution is an electrolyte um, that contains an ionic liquid. And so what happens in this case is that the first step is the charge transfer from the organic semiconductor onto the uh, molecular dopant. And then in the second step, that molecular dopant is exchanged for an ion of the electrolyte, for the, the anion um, um, of the electrolyte is exchanged with the um, 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 molecular dopant anion. And then what gets incorporated into the film is this pair of the mobile charge on the polymer and this electrolyte anion, the ionic liquid anion. And that has a number of advantages. Um, one of them is that you, you can use closed shell um, um, ions that are, tend to be more stable than those uh, molecular dopant radicals. Um, and, but the most important um, advantage for us here is that it allows us to choose the anion from a wide range of um, um, electrolyte ions, so a wide range of ionic liquids. And in this way, we can, um, we, we can vary the size and the shape of the um, anion very elegantly. Just very briefly how this process works, you can see here, um, it, this is for PB triple T, this conjugated polymer here. Um, we use ferric chloride as the molecular uh, dopant. Um, and then in this case, we use BMP TFSI as the ionic liquid. You can see this process works very well. This is the uh, absorption spectrum of the neutral polymer. And as we expose it to the dopant solution, you can see the neutral polymer being bleached very effectively. And you instead uh, see these charge-induced absorptions, these dopant-induced absorptions of the doped polymer. Um, if we use an excess of the ionic liquid, you can see here um, the dependence of conductivity and the residual ferric chloride concentration in this film. And so if the ion exchange process is efficient, you want to have no ferric chloride left in the film. You want to exchange all the ferric chloride with uh, TFSI. And you can see that if we use an excess of TFSI, a high concentration of TFSI of ionic liquid in the electrolyte, we can essentially drive this um, ion exchange to almost complete to complete um, ion exchange where there is no almost no ferric chloride left in the in the electrolyte. So it's an entropically driven process. Even if the free energy slightly favors um, the association between the uh, dope polymer and the molecular dopant. By using an excess of the ionic liquid, we can drive this uh, process towards a complete ion exchange. Um, we can, you can see here the, the kinetics. Um, so um, if you um, uh, yeah, expose the uh, film to a kind of solution for different times, you can see that initially it's, it's, um, this process doesn't happen Im immediately. So initially the ions get incorporated at the grain boundaries of the polymer. And then slowly they penetrate into the bulk of the um, uh, polymer film and basically expand the molecular lattice. They get these ions get incorporated into the lamellar spacing between the conjugated um, backbones. And at some point, essentially, there's almost like a phase transition where the, the, the kind of crystal structure of the polymer unzips, the, the lamella open up, and then this ions get incorporated very fast everywhere into these polymer lamella. And then we reach conductivities in that regime that go up to a thousand Siemens per centimeter. So very high electrical conductivities. We can determine how large the carrier concentration is. And so we use XPS and NMR to uh, quantify the, the concentration of the um, TFSI anions. And, and what we find is that those concentrations are very high they're on the order of eight times 10 to the 20 per cubic centimeter. And actually very good, very good agreement between um, um, XPS and NMR. So we are very confident about these um, uh, dopant concentrations. And what that means that essentially at, at, at long times, when we dope this for sufficient times, we have essentially one counter ion per repeat units. And so we've developed a model um, for the structure of these doped films, PB triple T films. And you can see that here. Um, you can see here that there is the TFSI anion, which is incorporated into this lamella 
um, in the region of the side chains, there's this little cavity here close to the polymer backbone. The lamella, they open up a little bit to make space for the anion, and the anion finds a very well-defined um, location um, close to the polymer backbone where it sits. And so the... Um, it's good. It's, 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 this, this model is in good agreement with the X-ray diffraction data, and it provides us now with a very well-defined system to study. As we now use different anions, um, um, we can study how this size and shape of the anion affects the charge transport along the backbone of the conjugated polymer. And so this is the systems. I mean, we are, we've actually done this now for a number of polymer systems, PB triple T is a semi-crystalline polymer, um, P3HT, um, also a, a semi-crystalline polymer, wi widely studied. And then we have two used, two donor acceptor polymers. One is IDTBT, which you've already seen. And then we've also looked at this DPP polymer. Um, and we've used different dopants, including very small dopants. PF6 is the smallest dopant that we've used and then went all the way to very large dopants, and this bath molecule is the largest dopant that we've explored. And for all these polymers and for all these dopants, we get very efficient ion exchange with almost complete bleaching of the neutral polymer absorptions, and so it's a very well-defined um, system to study this um, uh, dependence on ion size. And so here's the first system. I want to run through very briefly now through these different systems. Um, you can see here uh, GBAX uh, patterns of these uh, of PB triple T films doped with different um, ions. Um, so here is the PF6, and all the way down here is the BAF. Um, and what you can see is that essentially for all these ions, we retain very highly crystalline structures. In fact, the quality of the crystalline diffraction gets better when you dope. Um, the so-called paracrystallinity, which is a measure of the quality of this um, semi-crystalline structure, is reduced typically when we dope the polymer. And so this is a beautiful system to study the ion size dependence. And so you can see that um, on the right side here, we've plotted the conductivity. And this plot here is the uh, conductivity plotted versus this parameter lambda x, which is essentially a measure of the ion size. So PF6 is the smallest ion that's uh, over here. And then uh, on the right side, you have the larger ions. And what you can see is that the conductivity measured is actually not so strongly dependent on um, ion size. Um, um, maybe there is a small dependence here where you the conductivity increases slightly with um, ion size, as we might have expected. The, the larger the ion size, the further we separate the ions from the backbone, the, the shallower these columbic traps are supposed to be. But then at the largest ion, that trend is kind of not really confirmed. And so the, the other parameter that we'd like to correlate with is the paracrystallinity. You can see that here. And there seems to be a trend here that maybe the conductivity drops a little bit with para increasing paracrystallinity. As the crystallinity um, gets more disordered, um, the conductivity drops. But of course, from a single polymer, it's hard to be sure because there's a very narrow range of um, um, uh, paracrystallinities. Um, and so we were uh, interested in comparing that with other polymers. P3HT is an interesting system because in P3HT, when you dope um, with different ion sizes, the crystallinity rapidly decreases. So PF6 uh, doped PFP3HT is still highly crystalline. But if you go to TFSM, one of the larger ions, you can see the polymer almost becomes amorphous. And then you can do the same comparison. You can plot the conductivity versus ion size. And in this system, there is certainly no indication that smaller, uh, larger ions give higher conductivities. Um, larger ions clearly give lower conductivities here. Um, but there is a emerging correlation with the paracrystallinity. Um, the highest conductivities are achieved in the films with the lowest paracrystallinity. And that trend is also confirmed in the DPP polymer system, where we retain the crystallinity a little bit better. Um, but there is a small decrease in paracrystallinity as you go to larger ions. And that leads, again, to a drop 
of the conductivity. Um, and there is certainly no indication that larger ions um, help the conductivity also in, in this DPP-BTZ polymer. The only polymer that we found where we see a correlation with ion size that, that is suggesting larger ions increase the conductivity, that's in the IDTBT system, the least crystalline system, as I showed you before, IDTBT has a very low degree of crystallinity. And in IDTBT, we find that there, the smaller ions give smaller conductivities, whereas the largest ion, the BAF, gives us the highest conductivity. The conductivities in IDTBT are not very high, only up to 15 Siemens per centimeter. Um, but there we think because of that poor crystallinity of the polymer, um, there are configurations where the ions can get very close to the polymer backbone, and then the, um, the small ion size um, really induces these strong coulombic wells, and that's, de that's, that's detrimental to conductivities, and it helps to have a larger ion. But for the other polymers, there is no indication that larger ion size, um, uh, smaller ion size, um, degrade, degrades the conductivity. And that's plotted together in this plot here where you've all the polymers together and all the dopants. And you can see here that there's an empirical correlation between conductivity and degree of paracrystallinity. As you increase the paracrystallinity, the, the conductivity drops very sensitively. And so to explain these results, um, uh, we have developed a theoretical model. And uh, this theoretical model is a is a model Hamiltonian where we define a lattice of sites um, and uh, we um, induce um, yeah, this, uh, we parameterize this model Hamiltonian as realistically as possible. So you can see an example here. Um, this is an example of the um, the way we um, we have a, a we, there is dis, there is disorder in the lattice. Um, in particular, here is the um, the torsion angles that you see here distributed um, around an average value, and the model is parameterized from first principles calculations, where you this distribution of torsion angles that is illustrated here um, is is coming from a molecular dynamics uh, simulation of the um, the polymer. Um, and we'd even take into account that as the paracrystallinity expands the molecular lattice, this torsion angle distribution widens a little bit. So it's an as realistic as possible model Hamiltonian. It also takes into account the um, the dynamic coupling um, between um, the eigenstates. So we have a we have a um, torsional fluctuation of the molecular backbone incorporated in this model that introduces dynamic disorder into this Hamiltonian. And then the Hamiltonian also includes the interaction with the ions. The ions are sitting above and below this plane of um, two-dimensional sites. And uh, we can vary the distance between the ions and the um, conjugated plane to simulate the effect of ion size. And then finally, the model also includes the Coulombic interactions between electrons. And so you, in this two-dimensional lattice, the, the polymer chain direction is in, from X, from, in the X direction, and the pi pi stacking direction is in the Y direction. So you can see, for example, this distribution of pi pi stacking distances that's simulating the paracrystallinity of this polymer. So it's quite a realistic model of the um, electronic structure of such a conjugated polymer. And then we calculate the conductivity with the exact same framework that we used for the molecular crystals, this, con uh, this transient localization framework um, in this Kubo-Greenwald formalism, we, we use um, the relaxation time approximation to calculate the conductivity. So the theoretical framework is exactly the same as what we use for the molecular uh, crystals, but now, of course, incorporating the Coulombic interactions at these high charge densities because they are likely to be important. And so here you can see the results of the simulation. On the left-hand side is the density of states um, um, plotted as a function of, for two different ion sizes or for two different distances between the conjugated backbone and the ions, four and eight angstroms, and then also for different paracrystallinities. And so um, one thing that we can calculate using this density of states is the localization length, both along the chain, the L intra length is the localization length of the electron wave function along the chain. 
And then L inter is the delocalization between chains. So in typically we have delocalization over three, four uh, neighboring chains. And it's plotted here as a function of ion size for the four angstrom and the eight angstrom, the blue and the red uh, dots here. And then the x-axis is plotted as a function of paracrystallinity. And you can see here exactly the same what we observed in the experiments, which is that the ion size doesn't matter at all. The, the um, delocalization length of the electron states does not depend on ion size at all. It mainly depends on paracrystallinity. And the model then is out allowing us to calculate the conductivity. And first, we see very similar conductivity values in the model. So first principle models, there were no fit parameters, but we get uh, conductivities of 1,000 Siemens per centimeter at low paracrystallinities, um, which is what we see in the PBTT system. And then as a function of paracrystallinity, the, the, um, the conductivity drops um, quite sensitively by more than an order of magnitude. And we can even compare the slope of this dependence, um, theoretical dependence, with what we see in the experiments, and the values are surprisingly similar. So this model seems to predict very, very well the um, the transport properties of these um, um, doped conjugated polymers. And it it is there's two things that I want to emphasize. The first thing is that this is, as I said, it's the same model that we use for the molecular crystals. So this dynamic, um, this transit localization framework seems to describe also these dope polymers very well. So there's really a, a kind of common theoretical framework that allows you to understand the transport physics of these systems. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to emphasize is that the Coulombic interactions between carriers are actually quite important in these doped conducting polymers. You can see this here in the density of states plots where near the Fermi level, you see this dip in the density of states. And this dip in the density of states is a manifestation of the Coulombic interactions between carriers. And so that's clearly not not desirable. We want we want to have the density of states at the Fermi level to be as large as possible. Um, but we we now have a way to monitor this, and we're hoping to be able to find ways in which we can minimize these Coulombic interactions um, between carriers, and then that might provide a path to even higher electrical conductivities. We're starting to measure the thermoelectric properties. I don't really. I think I don't have time to, to go through that. Um, these, these kind of highly doped conducting polymers are quite interesting thermoelectric systems. They're not yet very good thermoelectrics. We achieve power factors on the order of 100 to 200 um, microwatts per meter squared Kelvin in the PBTT system, where we have conductivities of up to 5,000 Siemens per centimeter when we align the polymer uniaxially along the current flow direction. Um, but the thermoelectric coefficient is limited currently by the Seebeck coefficient, which tends to be quite low in these, um, in these highly conducting systems. Um, but we are very interested in using this understanding that we've gained now in the, into the charge transport physics of these doped systems to improve these thermoelectric properties. And with that, I want to come to the end. I hope I've given you a a reasonably a complete overview over how we understand charge transport in these systems. Um, I've explained that they they are fairly unique. Um, they are they have this characterized by this strong coupling between um, the charge dynamics, the structural dynamics, and that is kind of manifested in the molecular crystals. It's manifested in the conjugated polymers. But it's also manifested now, as we've seen, in the highly doped conducting polymers. Um, and uh, with that, I want to thank the people who are involved in this work, in particular um, on the polymer side, Ian Jacobs, um, Yushan Huang, and Dion Thieu in my, in my group in Cambridge. Um, we have a very long-standing collaborations with synthetic chemistry groups. In particular, I want to acknowledge Ian McCullough, now at Oxford, Martin Heaney at Imperial, um, and then also um, our longstanding collaboration with Ditching Zhang and Dao Benju at ICAS. Um, and then on the theory side, um, with the conducting polymers, Gabriele Davino in Grenoble, who did these model Hamiltonian simulations of the, um, of the um, conducting polymers. And then Vincent Lemour in David Beljohn's group, 
um, who did a lot of the molecular uh, or the quantum um, quantum chemistry calculations that, that I've shown. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, thanks for your great talk. Now it's time for discussion with Professor Hu. You uh, and uh, thank you very yes. much uh, for your great talk. Yeah, and uh, I noticed in this meeting room there are many friends, uh, Professor Shui Zhigao, <laughs> and uh, also uh, Professor Liu Chuan, and uh, Yuan Yuan Nan, and many 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 friends is in <laughs> in this meeting room. And uh, 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 I, I will ask. Uh, I would like to ask one question yeah, and uh, some more time for other friends. Yeah, uh, you just uh, you just mentioned uh, uh, for the charge transport there is a, a transit delocalization framework, and uh, I'd like to know and uh, uh, how large is this uh, framework and uh, uh, what factors determine the size uh, of this uh, uh, framework and. Uh, uh, it is possible to control the size of this uh, uh, delocalized uh, framework. Is, is it possible? Yeah. Yes, I'm yeah. just trying to navigate the system here to see you all. Um, um, it's a very good question, Wenping. Um, I mean, the, 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 the size of the electron wave function, if, that, if that's what you're interested in, um, is, of course, very sensitive to, in a molecular crystal, it would be very sensitive to the transfer integrals, um, the distribution of the transfer integrals, um, but also the, the 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 fluctuations. So if the fluctuations are strong, um, if the um, thermal disorder of the lattice is 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 strong, then then the electron would tend to be more localized. Um, and so if you go from a system like, I mean, in, in Rubrin, it's a system, the, this, this picture that I showed you, in that case, during these short bursts where the electron becomes very delocalized, you would have the electron wave function localized or delocalized over hundreds of molecules. And in a system like um, if you used, uh, well, pentacene, even pentacene, there the delocalization is much weaker. And during these bursts, the, the, the electron wave function is less delocalized. And that's directly related to the magnitude of the mobility. The reason why rubrin has such a high mobility is because the electron becomes so delocalized. And the hops that happen during these short bursts um, of, of delocalization, they are longer and longer. Um, and so you can influence this with the design of the molecule and, 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 and with, with the crystal packing and, and, and the structural dynamics that all, that all uh, is kind of governs this, this length, these length scales. Um, that means uh, uh, that this uh, uh, delocalization framework size is actually depend on the microstructure of this, uh, uh, films. If uh, uh, if the sink crystal, the, the, probably this uh, this the size of this film is uh, is fixed. Well, it's not so much the microstructure. I mean, the, of course, the grain boundaries they would matter um, for the long range charge transport. Um, but the the kind of this dynamics, the the structural um, dynamics affects the. Um, wave function mainly in the crystalline domains. Um, so it's the microstructure is, is, of course, as I said, it's important for the mobilities um, because grain boundaries can induce um, uh, barriers for transport. But what happens microscopically in the crystalline domains, that's what I've been focusing on um, in this talk. It's essentially the local um, dynamics of charges within the crystalline domains. Um, and of course, if you have traps, if you have uh, structural point defects or so, that can influence it, and um, the charges might be then become localized on um, individual uh, in individual environments and and not be able to do this um, delocalized, uh, structurally driven, um, oh, dynamically driven um, delocalization. But if you have a clean crystal where the trap density is low, then you should be able to uh, get into this regime where it's dominated by the dynamic. Um, disorder rather than the static energetic disorder. Okay, thank you very much, Henny. Okay, Lisa, my, my, okay. Face, my question. I, yeah. I guess Professor Shui will ask some question. Professor Shui, you can 
Hey, Henny, very nice to see you. Hi, Jigang. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, the very interesting uh, lectures. I, I'm very pleasure. I mean, very, I mean, inspiring. Uh, so I have uh, a few questions about, yeah, as you already yes. answered part of that, that I would like to ask the competition between the static disorder with respect to this, uh, your dynamic disorder or mm -hmm. organization. Well, you mentioned uh, actually, uh, if you have trap density, well, have you have any estimation of, uh, I mean, uh, to which extent, what, what kind of a static, what, what level of a static disorder would destroy such a transient localization, for instance? Just mm. my first question, I think that's competing. My second question is, uh, if uh, whether, have you estimated, uh, uh, what can I say? What would be the what will be the signature for the in the angle resolved uh, electron uh, photoelectron spectroscopy for this uh, transient localization mm -hmm. if it is localized? I mean, people have measured the band structure, for instance, like uh, Nobu or Weno. They measured mm -hmm. many many uh, uh, molecular crystals, which shows mm -hmm. some or always show. I mean, from uh, your. Uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, it seems mm. that the uh, intermolecular tra transfer, let's say T, is in the same order as your delta T. That means the fluctuation mm. Mm. in your yes. picture. Basically, delta T sometimes even more than T. So in that mm. case, I was wondering what would be the band structure measurement would look like? Because mm. in the band structure picture, we always assume T is dominant. So that means mm. you have one T, then of course you have a band structure. But now you have the delta T is such a big, huge. What would be the, I mean, the uh, single electron, uh, photo electron uh, emission spectroscopy? That, that mm. I think that people can measure that. Okay, thank mm. you. Well, these are very, very good questions. Um, and I don't know whether I have good answers. Um, so the, maybe start with the band structure um it's it's let me just go back to the um sorry this is a bit slow um, so the you're right i mean the the angle resolved photo emission should be able to probe um these and you know there are angle resolved photo emission measurements on rubrine that seem to show a band dispersion as you would expect from um from a more yeah band like um uh, electronic structure but there is also evidence in these uh, in these um, measurements for kind of electron phonon quite strong electron phonon coupling um and I don't know whether I, I don't think I'm sufficient expert on angle resolved photo emission to know what what signature you would have in a in a system where the electron states are quite delocalized um, over tens of molecules. Um, that's clearly I mean I'm an expert in charge transport and 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 that level of delocalization is sufficient to make the charges behave similar to a band-like carrier um, in the Hall mm -hmm. effect, for example, that this degree of delocalization is sufficient to mimic a band-like electron. You can see the same response in a Hall measurement. So I don't know whether the photo emission is, whether the situation there might be similar, that just a, I mean, if it was completely molecularly localized, then clearly you would not see a band dispersion as you see. But we have a finite delocalization here, and whether that's enough to mimic this dispersion that you see in photo emission, I, I don't. I don't know. I need to. You need to speak mm -hmm. to an expert there, um, Norbert or um, Weno San. Um, um, it's well. I, I don't think I know the answer to that question. Um, um, the first part of the question, can you just remind me? Um, yeah, the, uh, the static versus the dynamic disorder. Yeah, and to, yeah. what, to what extent that will destroy? Uh, I mean, in your later uh, example, like a conducting polymer, it seems that they, uh, it's quite a strong uh, static disorder. Yeah. But still, you can use this. Uh, 
uh, dynamic disorder model to estimate the, uh, for the, uh, the connectivity, it seems. Well, but there it's, I mean, it's it's essentially this coupling between eigenstates. Mm -hmm. That's what the dynamic disorder does. So the, the torsional fluctuations yeah. that we built into the model, they essentially induce coupling between the eigenstates along the backbone. And that enables the motion of charges along the backbone, um, as well as between, be, between chains. I mean, the charges are delocalized over multiple chains, but that, that dynamic disorder helps them to move from one um, eigenstate to another. Um, mm -hmm. um, in the molecular crystals, the simulations, I mean, I think Jochen's group has recently published some um, simulations of what happens when there is um, static disorder included in the model. Um, and then you do see um, a kind of a localization of charges um, in in uh, in regions of the film where there are kind of trap states, um, but it, with a with an a typical FET charge densities of ten to the twelve or so per square, square centimeter, um, we we think that at room temperature you're not so sensitive to that. You typically see those trap states when you cool down below two hundred or one hundred fifty Kelvin. Um, when the trap depth um, becomes um, comparable or larger than KT, but at room temperature, um, the charge density is are high enough that that the charge transport is not dominated and not determined by those trap states. In the best crystals, of course, there are systems where where the trap density is so high. But in rubrin, I think the trap density is low enough that at room temperature, you don't see the evidence of traps at, at, at in the trans transport at room temperature. OK, thank you. Thank you, Professor Weyler. Thanks. OK, uh, thanks, Professor Shai. Okay. I think uh, Shai Ding from Tianjin University will have some questions. Hi. OK, you, 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 can, you can start your question. Oh. Okay. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I'm Shushai Ding, and uh, um, about two years ago, uh, we were met and discussed about uh, organic metronics when I was a PhD candidate in Wenping Hu's uh, group. Yes, I remember. And, and, um, and to be honest, I still, I mean, I, 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 we have been missing our visits to China, but it's not so long ago, so I do remember. Yeah, it's so exciting to see you again. And uh, so uh, I have two uh, uh, simple questions. Uh, the first one is that um, considering the charge and spin injection interface between the electrodes and the organic semiconductor materials, uh, is it a bad thing or good thing to introduce the IQ chain? Mm, the, what, what do you think of this question? Introduce what? The IQ chain. Uh, like oh. uh, uh, C6, uh, C8. Carbon. Um, well, it, I, I, it's something that we've investigated um, um, a, a, a while ago. We had a paper just two years ago, I think, on um, spin injection from a ferromagnet into an organic semiconductor and using line width broadening measurements. So you basically um, measure the line width for ferromagnetic resonance in the ferromagnet um, as a function of the thickness of the organic semiconductor deposited on top of the ferromagnet. So if there is no spin injection, um, then the line width should be unaffected by whether an organic semiconductor is on top of the ferromagnet or not. Um, and if there is a broadening, then that's indicating that there is spin injection happening, that spins get injected. There's a mechanism for um, spin injection that broadens the fMR line width. And what we saw is that we, then we inserted different um, alkyl side chains deposited on top of the ferromagnet before depositing the organic. And what we saw is that just a short alkyl spacer can completely kill or reduce the um, spin injection um, quite um, strongly. So you need to have an intimate contact between the conjugated molecule and the ferromagnet to get spins injected 
um, into the ferromagnet. So in that system, I don't know whether that's a system that you have uh, that you have in mind, but there we saw evidence that uh, it's not a good idea to put a SAM, um, at least a normal alkyl SAM, um, in between the organic and the ferromagnet that reduces the efficiency for spin injection. There might be SAMs that promote the spin injection. I, I don't know about that, but... Um, it's it, in the systems that we looked at, it was important to get as intimate contact as possible between the organic semiconductor and the ferromagnet. Um, oh, thank you for I don't know your whether that answers your answer. question. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, I think in your paper, uh, when you're dealing with this problem, you use the microwave to uh, inject the spins. But mm. when we uh, dealing it with uh, the um, charge inj injection with spins, uh, what's different? Maybe, uh, is there any chance to uh, have a different between these two ways? It's possible. I mean, you we have not looked at electrical spin injection. Um, it was just a microwave technique that we used at the time, um, um, because the well we. we we preferred the microwave experiment because it's um, spin injection generally is really tricky to characterize because there is all, all these problems with when you when you use an electrical spin injection you have to be very careful making sure that there is no pinholes um, between through the organic semiconductor that can give rise to um, direct contacts between the two electrodes and we just found that very tricky um, our expertise was not so much in depositing pinhole free molecular films. Um, so we, we preferred the microwave techniques because that there's no issue with pinholes there. There is no second electrode. It's just a um, quite a quite an unambiguous way to characterize spin injection. Um, but I, I really don't know. I, mean, I don't want to. Uh, if, there might well be differences, and if you feel, if you find, I don't know whether you find that alkyl chains help, then that could well be. Um, there might well be reasons for that. Oh, okay. Thank you for your answer. Uh, it really uh, inspired me. Uh, and uh, my second question is about the ion exchange doping method. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. uh, you, know, you know, when I uh, doping PCHT with TFSI by the ion exchange doping method, uh, I found an increased uh, conductivity in the plane, but uh, decreased the conductivity in the perpendicular direction. Um, so mm -hmm. what's the possible reason? Um, can it simply be ascribed to the expansion parameters of the polymers? Well, that, that, that to some extent that makes makes some sense, doesn't it? Um, if you look at, sorry, my computer is a bit slow. I, it takes me time to go to the right slide. Um, I showed that the the conductivities that we measured here are all in plane conductivities. Um, and but I showed that when we dope, um, the degree of crystallinity in P3HT drops quite strongly. Um, so uh, almost there. So you can see that here. I don't have TFSI on this plot, but we've measured TFSI, um, and it's 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 kind of strongly reduced crystallinity. And this is of course an edge-on. Um, packing. So if you re if you perturb the crystallinity, you get more face on or more face on orientation, and that would tend to benefit the perpendicular conductivity. I would have thought. Um, so in in P three H T, I think it makes sense that there is this correlate uh, when that that as the in plane conductivity reduces, the out of plane conductivity might increase, um, because oh, the lamella okay. the lamella packing. Um, with the side chains perpendicular to the substrate clearly hinders the transport in the vertical direction. So if you perturb that and get some more face-on oriented um, regions, that would tend to benefit the vertical transport. I don't. I, I suspect that could be the reason. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your answer. And uh, yeah. uh, thank you for also thank you for your nice talk. And I really okay. do hope that I can have a chance to visit and study in your group. And I hope you have a nice day. And thank you. Thank again. you so much. That's nice to talk to you. Okay. Thanks, Trash. Uh, any further questions? I think uh, Professor Chen Liu from Zhongshan University.
Okay, you can ask a, a short, Hi, Henning. short question. Nice to see Okay. you. Nice to Hi, see John. you again. Really Nice long to see time you. haven't seen you. <laughs> yes, it's so sad that we can only Yeah. see each other on screens these days. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice talk. I, actually, actually, I'm trying to understand the uh, the theory of transient localization using the class. I mean, the class classification of schemes using the Hamiltonian. You know, when we mainly consider the band light transport, we consider the Hamiltonian with electron transfer term. And if we consider the um, phonon uh, polaron popping with dynamic disorder, we use the lattice vibration, including the diagonal and off-diagonal term. And when we uh, mainly consider the localized hopping, we have to consider the static disorder term. So, I mean, uh, when you when you tell about the transient localization, shall we just uh, modify the term of um, dynamic disorder? I mean, with the off-diagonal and diagonal term. Is that the main consideration? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mainly focused in this talk on the off-diagonal disorder, Hmm. not because I think that the on the the diagonal disorder is not important. Um, I mean, in the in the calculations, the diagonal disorder is included, um, and it does make a contribution to um, to the localization that 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 you see. Um, Um, and and so it makes a contribution um, to to uh, yeah to transport properties as well. So it's 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 it was just easier for me to focus on the non-diagonal term, but the diagonal one is um, uh, well, it's it's not has it, uh, it, yeah it's it's it need, need it should be included in all the considerations, and it's certainly included in all the calculations. Um, Okay. Okay, that's clear. So I'm um, just, yeah, I think it, I I see your calculation on the on the doping. So we need we presume that we have to know the, um, the ions, the position of ions, and and the, um, the degree of interactions, right? So we have to know that, and we have to, and then we can calculate. Is that right? For example, yeah. Well, I mean, this is a simple, I mean, let me, so I, I need to go back to, um, let me see whether I can switch this a bit more fast. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not so familiar with this platform here. Oh, we've lost the, I see, you, I think you stop the sharing, please. Yes, I will go back. Okay. Can you see it again? Um, Not yet. Okay. Okay, we can see that. Professor Henny, do, do you still Yes, have some I'm still here. Passion? <laughs> I'm still here. I'm just my computer is responding a bit slowly. Yeah, um, yeah. Got to pick up this him. is in triggering. Yeah. Um, can you see this slide again? Yes, we can see clearly. So the it, this I mean this this model is a little bit of course simplistic in the sense that we don't model the ions very accurately. Um, mm -hmm. It's a model Hamiltonian, so the ions are actually on a. A regular lattice here. The orange dots are the ions, um, and there are ions above and below. You can see these orange blobs above and below the conjugated plane, and they're on a regular lattice, whereas the polymer lattice underneath has some paracrystallinity and disorder. So essentially, the ion, the position of the ions is also mm. um, disordered, um, but it's not not a necessarily very realistic. Um, simulation of the interaction with the ions. Um, of course, we we would be like to refine that, but um, it was a that's the first step in the model to to implement it in this way. Um, okay, okay. Um, but I think what we can model quite nicely in this, I mean, you can separate the ions further and further back, and that should. Change the strength of the interaction with the with the carriers in the in the conjugated backbone, um, but in and, and essentially what happens here is that at, you have these very at these very high densities, 
um, 10 to the 8 times 10 to the 20, as I said, um, you, you just, these Coulombic wells start to overlap to a level where um, you, you, you smoothen them out to set, the electrons are sufficiently delocalized that they're essentially able to smooth and average over these Coulombic wells. And that's why the transport is so insensitive to the, to this distance R dope. Um, so the, the ion size really doesn't matter at these high densities because as long as the charges remain sufficiently localized, they're able to um, average over these individual Coulombic wells very efficiently. I mean, what surprised us a little bit, and that's something that we're looking at at the moment, um, if you go to lower ion densities, um, that actually persists for quite a long time. And we're a bit surprised by that. Um, at, at very low densities, we know already from previous work that there is strong Coulombic trapping. But this regime seems to be seems to be valid um, over quite a wide range of doping densities. And we're trying to understand why that is currently. Okay, quite clear. And then as Professor Licha asked me to do short, so I'm trying to <laughs> let this let others to raise questions. At least we, we hope so to, well, to, to <laughs> Yeah, we hope to ski with you again, Henning. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it will. Um, if, let, let the first step would me would be for me to come back to China. I hope. Yeah, okay. I mean, this year so. that's not likely to be possible, of course. Okay. But hopefully, next hopefully. year there might be an opportunity. Um, one never knows. We hope. We okay. Can, okay. Can, can, come to China it's, this year. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, well, we, we would we would love to if if the borders open. We would be we would be coming to China very uh, quickly, but uh, at for unfortunately at the moment, it's so difficult. The yeah. flights are very expensive and it's almost impossible to get a visa. So it's, yeah, it's not not, not, not possible. Okay, very nice to see you. But it's very nice to see you all again. I think it's, okay. it's yeah. uh, really pleased. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I think yeah, yeah. we yeah. have yeah. to stop now. Yuan Yuan from yeah. Hunan University. Hey, you yeah. can ask the Hi, Hani. It's, it's Hi, good to see you all here. Yeah. 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 I, I have one quick question. So for yes, the doping studies, uh, the, the conductivity is almost independent on the ion side, yes. uh, just given on the pyrocrystal crystallinity. So how about the feedback coefficient? If we exclude the effect of uh, pyrocrystallinity, how about the coefficient, feedback coefficient? Would it be dependent on the ion side? Mm -hmm. Um, it's something we've we've just uh, submitted a paper on this, um, um, and the, we also we, in that it's not this, exactly the same system that we've studied here, but there we've not seen a significant dependence on iron size either. Um, but we don't have a full understanding of that yet. It's a relatively small variation in iron size that we've looked at there. Um, but it would be not surprising, I think, if if the electrical conductivity does not depend on ion size that would suggest the density of states um, to be relatively independent of ion size. And that would mean that also the Seebeck coefficient shouldn't depend on ion size. And I think that's something we've confirmed in, in a kind of limited range. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that means, the, yeah. that means the energetic disorder is not dominant in, in such a case. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but the the energetic disorder or the density of states, uh, as I've kind of you can see it here. Um, sorry, the next slide. Um, as you can see here, if you compare the density of states at different ion sizes, the four angstrom to eight angstrom, they're very similar, um, and as a result, then the carrier delocalization lengths and the conductivities don't depend on ion size. Um, but if the density of states is very similar, then you would also not expect necessarily the Seebeck coefficient to be very different for different ions. And, and that's something that we've seen um, in, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, in a that's subset. A, I see. I see. That's very uh, interesting. I mean. Okay. Yeah. That's my question. Thank you. And have Thanks a good day. Me. Thanks. Thanks. Nice yeah, to yeah. See you. Thank okay. you all. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I think the, the lecture is all over the schedule. Oh. We have to stop stop now. Yeah. Uh, Professor Hu or Professor Shui, do you have some 
Yes, and uh, the Max. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you uh, very much for your great uh, contribution to uh, SmartMate and also uh, all friends great contribution for SmartMate and uh, also uh, as you can see so many friends are missing you and uh, and hope you <laughs> you can we can meet you uh, in China this year and uh, finally uh, based regards to Euro and uh, all the kids and uh, uh, art's good. Thank you, Wenping. I mean, you are a powerful man. Maybe if you can convince the Chinese government to give us a visa, then, <laughs> then we would be very happy to come. <laughs> uh, and probably uh, in this year, the, the border will be open. Yeah. Hope. Hopefully, yes. So we would be very happy to see you all again. Um, yeah. Do you? Okay, if no 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 others, thank you very much again, uh, Henny, and uh, uh, bye bye. See you. Thank you very much. Have a good okay. evening, and, and thank you so yeah, much yeah, for yeah. the invitation. Okay. It was a great pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye, bye, -bye. and all, bye. All, all friends bye. and Henny. Yeah.